I think one of the questions that we grapple with in the church today concerns the limitations of fellowship. To whom should fellowship be extended? To whom should fellowship be excluded? And thus the panel has been selected to discuss the various facets of this question. And we selected a panel that I feel is outstanding. I want to introduce them to you. On the far left, Brother Dan Flournoy, who preaches for the Beltline Congregation over in Irving, will be the panel leader, and he will uh, lead the discussion. Next to him is Brother Perry Hall, who preaches for the University Avenue Congregation in Tyler, both of these gentlemen outstanding preachers. Brother Asa Keel in the center, known by most of us in the Fort Worth area, uh, occupied full-time in hospital visitation, uh, reaching out to people uh, in this means, an outstanding person. Next to him, Brother Gary Summers, who is the preacher for the Pearl Street Congregation in Denton, tremendous talent. And then next to him, of course, all of you know Brother Richard Massey, uh, who teaches here in the school, who's recently moved to Oklahoma. All of these gentlemen are are splendid individuals and very well capable of discussing the subject. I do want to caution the panel, when you speak, make sure you've got the microphone up close to your mouth where people can hear. After they have uh, given us an overview of the topic and uh, have shown us the problems involved and discussed it among themselves for a few moments, then the uh, audience will have opportunity to uh, ask questions. We have two young men with the uh, roving speakers and so if you have any question that results from what is said or something that you don't understand, you be ready to ask those questions. We would ask you to speak directly into the microphone, state your name, where you're from, and then uh, articulate your question. Thank you so much. We'll turn it over to Dan Florinoff. appreciate the assignment. It is one that I think is most important and one I think uh, needs to be uh, discussed uh, thoroughly and uh, we have a panel assembled today that I think is capable of doing that and I have uh, been authorized to uh, tell each one of them they have uh, about three minutes to summarize what they have to say but I have also been authorized as the uh, panel leader to uh, use a little discretion, so I have told those fellows to spend as much time as they can so these po <laughs> folks out here won't have so many fish bones to throw out to choke us on. <clears throat> so with that in mind, we will proceed with uh, the subject of fellowship. The word fellowship, of course, comes from the Greek word koinonia, which has been variously translated communion, uh, it means a joint participation. Uh, it is a common union uh, in those things that we uh, participate in. We have fellowship. Uh, fellowship may be described as a triangle with God at the apex and uh, brothers in Christ uh, forming the bottom part of the triangle. Whenever an individual is uh, born again, he is born into the family of God, John 3, verse 5. Uh, he is then uh, not born again in an isolated uh, situation, but he has brothers and sisters in Christ. And so I'm in fellowship with uh, those who are in fellowship with God. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. We have fellowship with one another. That's a vertical fellowship that we have with God. And we have a horizontal fellowship with all others who are in fellowship with God. Whosoever goeth onward and abideth not in the teaching of Christ hath not God. Now, those who maybe at one time were in the family but have gone onward, uh, such as the prodigal son who has left the good graces of the father, although he may still technically be a family member, uh, yet is subject to uh, being uh, disinherited and so no longer in fellowship. Uh, we have responsibility, therefore, to abide in the teaching of Christ and to walk in the light as he is in the light. When fellowship is broken between a brother and God, then the fellowship is automatically broken between brothers in Christ. It is uh, one's relationship with God that uh, determines uh, 
what uh, power and meaning fellowship has. Uh, we have uh, some who have uh, been baptized into Christ and uh, have perhaps been faithful for a few weeks or months and uh, then fell away and never did really establish much of a fellowship with the body of Christ, nor did they establish much of a fellowship with God. Um, we might go to those individuals and uh, threaten a withdrawal of fellowship from them, and it would have very little impact on their lives, very little meaning to them. But for someone who has been a faithful Christian for a number of years and finds himself then overtaken in a trespass, there is power and there is meaning when uh, we are instructed, uh, brethren, if, if a brother be overtaken in a trespass, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, looking unto thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Then there is power, and we can go to an individual like that and uh, discuss the uh, possibility of withdrawing that fellowship from them if they do not make corrections in their lives. So one's relationship with God determines when fellowship has a meaning and power. Our assignment is to answer the question, what are the limitations of fellowship? Uh, how broad is fellowship in Christ? Who is included in the fellowship? And who is excluded from the fellowship? Who is faithful? And uh, I want to reserve a few um, comments for just uh, at the end, maybe summarize what uh, we're saying here. And so I want to uh, then uh, pass this to uh, the panel members. We will, uh, each one will uh, summarize his uh, particular part. If you have the lectureship book, you'll note that these manuscripts, uh, some get rather lengthy and it's very difficult to summarize these things in three minutes. But uh, we'll uh, begin with uh, Perry Hall discussing God's law of authority and then Asa Keel will discuss God's law of faithfulness. Gary Summers will speak on God's law of exclusion, and then Richard Massey, God's law of inclusion. So we turn it now to Perry Hall, God's law of authority. Uh, thank you, Brother Dan, for delivering my talk. Asa? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> God's law of authority, fellowship. The fellowship of man that does not arise out of fellowship with God has no meaning or validity in the Christian religion. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. I think that we could all take a lesson from the synagogue building Roman centurion found in Matthew 8, when out of his humility and his deep faith in Christ, he sent Jewish elders to Jesus that Jesus might come and heal a beloved servant that was dying. As Jesus approached his house, he sent others out and said that he was not worthy that Jesus should come under his roof, but speak the word only and his servant would be healed. He said, I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and saying to one, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to another, do this, and he does it. He said, speak the word, Lord. Now, since he was a man under authority and had those under him over whom he resided, he knew that Christ, as the embodiment of God's authority, having power over physical illness, over the universe, over all the things that he had done, like Nicodemus, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man could do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. So he knew that Christ had this authority. And what establishes fellowship is the fact that we say with this centurion, I am a man under authority. We are all under the authority of God. 
Now, when we look at the concept of law and authority, we know that law can brief, be briefly summarized as a standard, a rule of conduct given by those who are recognized to be in places of authority, to have the right to command, the right to implement, the right to enforce. It is God's right to rule you and me because he is our creator. Paul asked the question in Romans chapter 9 beginning with verse 20, Shall the thing formed say to him that formed him, Why hast thou made me so? Hath not the potter power over the clay? Does not the potter have power or authority over the clay to make one vessel unto an honor and to another unto dishonor? And as we go back to the Old Testament prophet, we see that God, in giving this parable or this illustration, did not act whimsically or arbitrarily in this matter. It was how that the clay responded to his touch. And so we must respond to the authority of God. And when we do that, then we can be in fellowship one with another. But we soon discover in this law of authority that God delegated all authority to his son, Jesus Christ. In Old Testament prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, verse 18, Moses was told, I will raise unto thee a prophet like unto thee from thy people. I shall put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whoever will not hearken unto my word, which he shall speak in my name, he shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Jehovah God spoke from on high in Matthew 17, 5, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. In John 12, 48, we find that, that Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that shall judge him, the words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. But Jesus realized that his time on earth was limited, and he had his hand-picked apostles. He told them that he was going to go away, and he would send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, to guide them into all truth and bring all things to their remembrance, whatsoever he had said unto them. In Matthew 18, 18, he said, and this is basically the Greek itself, Whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. And so as these men were inspired by the Holy Spirit, they began to write epistles or letters speaking in words not which man's wisdom taught, but words which the Holy Spirit taught, comparing spiritual things with spiritual words. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13 and following. Paul, in writing to the church at Ephesus, said that when you read what I write, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets through the Spirit. Today we know that word as the Bible, the New Testament covenant that concerns us, that all scripture is given by inspiration of God, it equips us completely, that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and we find God's chain of authority, delegating that authority to his son, who through the Holy Spirit inspired his apostles, and they, being inspired men, wrote it down, and now that inspired word is an inspired book. And when we violate the teachings of the New Testament, then we break the chain, and we find ourselves in deep, deep trouble. The apostle Paul warned us not to preach any other gospel, Jude said, contend earnestly for the faith that has been delivered once for all time to the saints. And if we add to or take from, we are in deep trouble. God's law of authority is the Bible, the scriptures, and particularly to us, the New Testament covenant of Jesus Christ. May we love it, may we live it, may we uphold it and defend it till our dying breath. Thank you, Perry. My topic is God's law of faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 1, 9, of course, tells us that God is faithful. And everything we are, everything we have, everything we do, every hope we hold depends upon the fact of God's being faithful. 
he's not faithful, we're in serious trouble in every area. And I believe that's why it says that um, in Hebrews 6.18, it's impossible for him to lie. Faithful people don't lie. And God is faithful. Therefore, impossible for him to lie. And as is our God, so is his laws. In his natural laws, we see apples still growing on apple trees, and we still see the sun rising every morning. Why? Because God is faithful. In his natural laws, we see that. And then as we see that in natural law, it should be obvious that so is his spiritual law, which is the word of God, which all of us hold in our hands, and, and hopefully even more in our hearts, that we live by it and let it guide us. But I believe that God was also tested in the Garden of Eden because he had made man. His law of faithfulness, his being faithful, was tested. He had made man. He had communion, fellowship which, with Adam and Eve, which he enjoyed. But he had said this, that in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die, and they ate of it. Now what was God going to do? Was he going to remain faithful? Or was he going to say, well, like so many of us do today as parents, well, that, don't do that again. Or we just kind of slap the back of their hand. God was faithful. And Adam and Eve weren't the first ones to find, weren't the last ones to find that out, were they? Down through the Old Testament, Cain and the Israelites in the wilderness and all down through the ages in the New Testament, we have um, our examples of Ananias and Sapphira. We have the beast of Revelation all the way through, back and forth. Whenever God made a promise, a blessing to be received or a punishment to be received if there were disobedience involved, that God was going to be faithful and then as Perry mentioned in Matthew 18 and 18, whatever is bound on earth, whatever law he gives us, whatever instructions that Jesus said, observe to do them, and I'll be with you, Matthew 18 and 20, he says, it's also bound in heaven. Now God is going to be faithful to his part. Whatever is bound here is bound there, and it's our, our intent and our effort and our love is to search the scriptures to find out exactly what is bound, what is not bound, that we may live thereby. Why? That we may be the other end, the other part of that faithful covenant of which God is the originator. But God cannot have fellowship with those who lie and those who are unfaithful. And so as God is faithful, we are to be faithful. And in Hebrews 11:6 it says, Without faith it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God, number one, must believe not only that he exists, that he exists, that he is, but also that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And I believe that is the, the heart of faith, is to believe God, his promises, his rewards, and then by his grace, he has put it within our grasp of how we may have those rewards. And that whole chapter of Hebrews 11 is filled with a response of faith to God's faithfulness. Man's response to God's faithfulness and God's grace. And therefore, Noah built an ark to the saving of his house. And Abraham, when he was called, went out. And, and all those tremendous examples that we have there, I believe, is a pattern for us to follow that God, fellowship with God, a faithful God, requires a faithful people. Mercifully, God has put in, put in his plan for us, bound on earth, that when we fall on our face, he gives us opportunity to get up and walk with him again. And when we walk in the light, as already been mentioned, as he is in the light, we enjoy that great fellowship. But fellowship with God is for the faithful. And finally, in closing, God binds himself to what degree? I believe in Hebrews 9.20, Two is one of the greatest challenges that I see in the entire scriptures of God's faithfulness. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. What did it cost God to be faithful to that? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. What did it cost God to be faithful in upholding and keeping that? It cost him his son. And to accuse God of being 
legalistic because he faithfully keeps every law and every covenant to every jot and tittle, Matthew the fifth chapter. It's not legalism. It's love and care and concern on his part and faithfulness in observing law and serving him is a response of love and faith on our part. Thank you. I'd like to begin our discussion of the law of exclusion by considering what the prophet Jehu told King Jehoshaphat. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. The king of Judah had allied himself with the evil Ahab, 2 Chronicles 19.2. What could this usually righteous king possibly have been thinking of? Israel's devotion to idolatry could not have escaped his attention, especially since he specifically asked to hear a prophet of the Lord that day and what he had to say. So why is he consorting with Ahab and making inane statements such as, I am as you are, and my people as your people, we will be with you in war. Jehoshaphat should have excluded Ahab from fellowship rather than extending it to him. For the past several decades, there's been an emphasis in the religious community upon unity. Several spokesmen for different denominations have been encouraging an ecumenical spirit, and now, as has been brought to the forefront in the last few days, so are many who were once among us. They are climbing aboard the philosophical bandwagon with such profound reasoning as, well, he says that he believes in Jesus. I guess that makes him my brother. Where does this come from? Not from the scriptures. Never mind if someone has repented of his sins. Don't think about whether he's been baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. Does he feel that he's saved? That's all that seems to matter to some. So bent on attaining unity are some brethren that the word exclusive has become a pejorative term. To exclude someone from fellowship has just about become the equivalent of the unpardonable sin. Of course, unity is desirable. Psalm 133 and verse 1, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And certainly that needs to be emphasized. In fact, many congregations have experienced problems and division because brethren did not make a serious endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. But the same God who inspired those words also told us that unity was not the first priority. Jesus told his apostles, do not think that I am come to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Matthew 10, 34. If such a statement surprised his apostles, it would undoubtedly mortify the modern day disciples of the spiritual Rodney Kings who say, can't we just all get along? Jesus is telling us that although unity is important to God, there are some other things that take precedence. But before we notice what some of those things are, some things that are more important than unity, let us affirm that God himself has a history of excluding some from fellowship. His right to exclude began before the world was created. We read in 2 Peter 2, 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them to chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and the passage goes on for several verses, but you get the idea. God excluded the angels who sinned and who rebelled from his fellowship. Why were they excluded from heaven? Because they chose to sin. God does not fellowship sin. He excluded them who made that decision. When every intent of the thoughts and of the heart was only evil continually, Genesis 6, 5, mankind on the face of the whole earth was excluded from God's fellowship by means of the flood. When, despite the fact that God spoke the Ten Commandments to the people, they broke them just weeks later by engaging in idolatry and revelry, God divided the people into two groups and put the impenitent group to death. Exodus 32, 26 through 28. Because of the disobedience of Korah and Dathan and Abiram, Moses bade the people to depart from their tents while God took their lives. 
Numbers 32, or 16, 24 through 33. And there are many, many other examples that could be given, but we see that God excludes people from his fellowship. There are some things that are more important than fellowship and unity. And here are a quick list of those things. The first is moral purity. You'll just have to read the book on this. It's uh, something that we're uh, familiar with, but we could spend a good uh, measure of time talking about them anyway. Things that pertain to matters such as fornication, adultery, homosexuality, drunkenness, and so forth. The second category is love of brethren. Love of brethren is something that we may not uh, think of in this category, but I want you to notice a few things that John said. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now, 1 John 2, 9. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother, 1 John 3, 10. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, 1 John 3, 15. And 1 John 4, 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. Paul lists three expressions of hatred toward others in 1 Corinthians 5.11. The first one of those, and we won't have time to talk about the other two, but I want to talk about this one, is a reviler or a railer, King James. This is one who speaks against others, an incorrect usage of the tongue. Paul does not say whether these railings are directed toward those outside or toward brethren, but unfortunately we do have this problem and it exists in the church. And it is a ground for withdrawing fellowship from someone because he lacks love for his brothers and his sisters and does not control his tongue. No brother or sister should be the object of a fellow Christian's wrath. No one has the right to venomously attack a brother or sister for whom Christ died. There is a means that's already been mentioned, Matthew 18, for dealing with those things. If a problem persists between brethren, there is still no justification for somebody becoming the Paul Revere of personal vendettas, shouting his grievances to everybody within earshot and buttonholing people to make sure they've heard about his complaint. James warns us against the misuse of the tongue, James 3, 1 through 10. Only eternity will reveal how much damage an unloving tongue has wrought. It is sinful to hate, attack verbally, bite, and devour one another. Galatians 5 and verse 15. The one with the reviling tongue must be excluded from Christian fellowship. And of course, we don't mean someone who inadvertently says something inappropriate, but someone who makes this a practice. The third area is love of God. Love of God is more important than unity and fellowship. And one of the things that has constantly plagued God's people is that of idolatry. The last verse of 1 John, little children, keep yourself from idols. But of course, it's also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 5.11. Some modern day examples of idolatry? Well, a brief list might include such things as materialism, self-sufficiency, the idea of unlimited human potential, secular humanism, psychology, philosophy, the exaltation of angels, self-help gurus, trance channelers, horoscopes, health and fitness, sports, entertainment, television, soap operas, recording stars, the flesh, sex, political correctness, false religion, public schools, sports, your career, and in short, anything that becomes more important than God or comes between you and God and Jesus Christ in the church is an idol and it needs to be dispensed with, and we need to restore the first priority that God wants us to have. The fourth area is love of truth. In 2 Thessalonians 2.10, we read that God allows some to be deceived because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Many today have bought into the false doctrine that unity is more important than truth. The folksy way this idea has often been expressed is, well, we're all probably in error on something anyway, therefore let us not be judgmental about others. That would be a fine sentiment if the Bible supported it. But the Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. Proverbs 23, 23. 
And Jesus prayed for his disciples to walk according to the truth. And in fact, if we're going to be saved, we must continue in the truth, John 8, 31 and 32. If doctrine is of so little consequence, why did Paul warn everyone day and night with tears about what was going to happen in their midst? The fact is, doctrine matters. It matters so much that it takes precedence over unity. Doctrine was so important even in the days of Moses that they were not to add to or take away from the things that were said. And of course, that principle is throughout the Bible. Should we help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Yes, if we think we'll enjoy the wrath of God because that's what comes as a result of doing so. We can either practice God's law of exclusion or we can walk disorderly. We need to be careful about moral purity, the love of brethren, the love of God, and the love of truth. These are all scriptural concepts and things that if we violate, God will exclude us from his fellowship. Fellowship inclusion. Who can we include? Who can we consider a brother or sister in Christ? Who are those to whom we can extend the right hand of fellowship? That's what we're talking about in our inclusion segment of this. We know that fellowship is desired because of passages like Psalm 133 and verse 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Togetherness, we ought to desire it. And we ought to put just as much emphasis on desiring and striving for fellowship as we do on the exclusion of fellowship for those scriptural reasons, of course. And so we should want to have fellowship. It is desired, it is sweet, it is enjoined upon us in passages like Ephesians 4 and verse 3. We are to give diligence, we are to endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And so it is desired and it is essential. God has designed it, it's wonderful, it's a wonderful thing. God's designed it and we ought to seek after it. We ought to strive to maintain fellowship where we can. So who is our brethren and who are those to whom we can extend our fellowship to? Well, those who have obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ as revealed in the 27 books of the New Testament. A case of obedience to the gospel of Christ as revealed in the New Testament is Acts 2. Those people had violated, they had transgressed the word of God and they were told to repent and to be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of their sins. And 3,000, it is recorded on that day, about 3,000, did what the inspired apostles said and it says in verse 42 that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship. Those who've obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ as revealed in the New Testament are those that can qualify for fellowship. But secondly, they must be a part of the church revealed in the 27 books of the New Testament. The one church, the one kingdom that Jesus said that he was going to build in Matthew 16 and verse 18. They must be a part of that church that worships according to the plan and the pattern there given in the New Testament. I know people who have claimed to be a member of the Baptist church. They claim that they were baptized for the remission of their sins. But I couldn't have fellowship with them because they are not in the church of our New Testament. And so because one has obeyed the gospel does not necessarily mean that he qualifies for fellowship. So he must obey the gospel plan of salvation he must be a part of the one church of the New Testament and he must also abide in the doctrine of Christ. In 2 John verse 9, the last part of that verse says, He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, 
He hath both the Father and the Son. And so those are people that qualify as those to whom we can include in our fellowship. And when we say that, we mean people with whom we can work evangelistically with. We can work with those people. They are included in the fellowship. Those are the people with whom we can worship with. Those who obey the gospel as revealed in the New Testament, those who are part of the church of the New Testament, and those who are abiding according to the doctrine of the New Testament, we can worship with those people. We can work with those people. We can train gospel preachers. We can involve ourselves in the work of training gospel preachers with those people. We can do benevolent work with those people because they are our brethren. We can edify them. We can encourage them. We can build them up. We should seek for them to also edify us and build us up because they have fellowship with God and we can have fellowship with them. We ought to be looking for and maintaining fellowship with those people, those who teach the same thing that the Bible teaches on marriage and divorce and remarriage. We ought, those people, that's the things that we're talking about. We ought to try to maintain fellowship with those people and, of course, many other things. We must be careful not to sever fellowship over matters we perceive to be liberal. For instance... I don't believe that we ought to spend the Lord's money on building gymnasiums. I just don't believe that at all. And I think it's not good stewardship of God's money when we have billions of people in our world who are lost and who need to hear the gospel and we go over here and build us a gymnasium. But just because I perceive that that is following a liberalistic philosophy because I perceive that's what the Baptists do and that's what our liberal brethren do, I, I must not perceive that they are liberal because they haven't spent the money the way I think they ought to. You know, some people may not like this paneling up here, may think this paneling is an excessive expenditure or the carpet here, but they're not teaching any different doctrine. It's the same doctrine. And so I need to be careful not to sever lines of fellowship. I need to include in that fellowship. I know a fellow who doesn't believe that we ought to have Bible quiz or a Bible bowl. He perceives that is a leaning toward liberalism. He perceives in his mind. And he has a, a, an argument that doesn't come out of the scriptures, but there's an argument nonetheless. And so he believes that's wrong. And he tends to want to draw a line there. But our fellowship involves those who've obeyed the gospel of Christ, who are in the one church of the New Testament, and that abide in the teachings of these 27 books. And so sometimes we reason that liberals and denominational groups do this. They do this. They have a Bible bowl. You're having a Bible bowl. Therefore, you're liberal. And that's not a sound argument. That's not the argument that, that meshes with the Bible. And who do we help? Who do we help when we draw lines of fellowship over things we perceive and we view as liberal? Who do we help? Do we help the church? Or do we help the devil? We're talking about fellowship and inclusion. And so if we disagree on something, I beseech us to use Christian courtesy and kindness, cordiality. And so let us seek after fellowship to maintain it with those that the Bible says that we can have fellowship with. Yes. All right, I want to thank our panelists for... Uh this brief summary uh, of their uh, various uh, 
uh, lessons, the aspect of this subject of fellowship, and now we'll open it to the panel first to um, uh, ask if we have any on the panel that would uh, pose a question for another panel member or for uh, uh, anyone in general. Um, I suppose it's open season on the brethren in the audience, so you might have uh, see someone in the audience that you'd like to to uh, pose a question to uh, before they start uh, pulling the uh, fish bones out of their uh, little bags. Any any questions? If you don't ask one, I will. <clears throat> uh, let me uh, pose a um, a uh, situation that uh, uh, might possibly arise in regard to fellowship and the extent of fellowship. Uh, let's suppose that uh, in the congregation where I'm preaching, we uh, uh, are in fellowship with a sister congregation, um, but we find out that uh, that sister congregation has in it um, uh, one or two who are involved in uh, matters of immorality. And it has also come to our attention that in that congregation uh, there are some who teach uh, false doctrine, uh, especially concerning the resurrection. And uh, furthermore, there is some uh, uh, question as to uh, the, the way they observe the Lord's Supper. Uh, they may be uh, uh, doing some things that we're not... Uh, uh, used to, for example, they might be dimming the lights during the Lord's Supper, or they might be incorporating other aspects of worship uh, during the, the Lord's Supper. While they're serving the Lord's Supper, they might be singing, um, or they might uh, they might even have uh, uh, someone reading scripture or or something of that nature. But there may be several things that we would question in regard to that sister congregation. What would be our attitude towards them is, are these things matters that uh, we would uh, uh, consider uh, need to withdraw our fellowship from them? Or is that even a possibility of withdrawing our fellowship from a congregation? Uh, or would we uh, want to uh, uh, go about this in some other way? So I'm just... Uh, uh, wait for the hands to, to fly up here, the volunteers to uh, deal with this problem. Gary Summers. <clears throat> the uh, situation you describe is uh, one that sometimes we uh, begin to make decisions on immediately. And the problem with that is we need more information. Uh, it's hard to know what the internal situation of another congregation is and we should be uh, uh, very loath to make quick judgments. Uh, actually, what you described sounds a whole lot like Corinth. <laughs> <laughs> there were uh, one or two teaching a false doctrine concerning the resurrection, and uh, there was a case of immorality. But you'll notice that Paul told them they needed to deal with these matters. And uh, as a sister congregation, I think, <clears throat> you know, uh, we should encourage them to do likewise because uh, these are serious matters or else Paul would have said, I've heard that you have all these problems, but ah, so what? And uh, of course that obviously was not his attitude. Yeah, was, when you was saying those things, it sounded like Corinth to me because when I get discouraged in the church, I go back and read Corinthians and think, what if I preach there? <laughs> uh, that's kind of my favorite encouraging passage and say, hang in there, Paul, I guess. But I think we have another uh, really good illustration along this line is in the uh, two, second and third chapters of Revelation. Uh, the seven churches, uh, it says, turn neither to the right or to the left, like it told Joshua, and I think in in Revelation 2 and 3, we have churches turning to the right and to the left in just about every other direction uh, that's wrong in a lot of these cases. But even with the ones at Thyatira, where there was that woman Jezebel who was a, calls herself a prophetess and she teacheth my, uh, sedu seduceth my servants to commit fornications, to eat things sacrificed to idols. He says, I gave her space or time to repent. Well, there was a space in there, but there also comes a time when there wasn't. 
But within that same congregation, he says, as many as have not received this doctrine, I lay upon them no other burden or no other uh, difficulty. So even within that congregation, there seemed to be those who uh, didn't like what was going on. And to disfellowship Thyatira, our modern Thyatiras, if you want to say that, or back up to Pergamos, where he's dealing with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans uh, and Balaam, uh, to disfellowship the whole congregation, I think we have a very difficult time because we don't know who's within that. Um, I do think maybe there needs to be, if it's in our area, if it's involving our people and our people are getting mixed up with it and it, it becomes a part of our congregation's problems too, I think there definitely needs to be a meeting of those in the church, the other congregation, to find out the source of the problem, see what can be done done about it. Um, I'll opinion right quick, but uh, the disfellowship in congregation can be very, very difficult. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> I think that we have to be very careful and very patient, but I do think uh, that there comes a time when we do have to make public statements with regard to even congregations. When my devoted wife and I moved to Denton in the early 70s, uh, the churches in Denton had been greatly affected by uh, the unity and diversity movement. Uh, Carl Ketcherside, Leroy Garrett, uh, were, Leroy was a citizen of the city and influenced the congregations there to a great degree and uh, we moved into that. I could talk for hours on the seven years of experience that I had uh, in that particular work but when those brethren began to go out from us about 200 under the leadership of a couple of the elders and uh, Leroy they had already reached the position of embracing denominationalism. They joined a denominational alliance of 12 religious groups. They moved a couple of pianos into their worship facility, though they claimed they did not use them during worship period. They hired a band on Friday evening through big dances. I've got all of this uh, documented in the local Denton paper. Uh, so we had a long, hard struggle there. And after a few months of writing letters and of pleading with those brethren to repent and to come back, we felt that we were forced to warn the uh, Brotherhood about the situation. And so a long uh, letter was written and sent to some of our gospel papers because uh, we felt that they had gone beyond some of the things that uh, these other brethren have mentioned. And I certainly agree with everything that's been said thus far, but I think you finally reached the point after much patience, a lot of prayer, a lot of talking, that uh, it is in order to mark even a congregation. Mark those that cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own bellies and by their good words and fair speeches deceive they the hearts of the simple or the unsuspecting. All right, thank you very much. I uh, use this little illustration which does sound vaguely like um, the Corinthian brethren. Um, but we note uh, in the uh, introduction to Paul's letter, in the first uh, Corinthian letter, that he addresses them as the church of God, which is at Corinth. Um, <clears throat> no, I don't think I would want to accept an invitation to preach for that congregation. Uh, Apollos was not at all minded to go there. Um, so um, there are a few places that we might not uh, want to preach. However, should you find yourself in that uh, situation, uh, what you have to do is just preach the word. If this is a sister congregation, and this is where my question came in, um, how, how do we view these brethren and how can we uh, 
uh, continue to have fellowship with them. We note that Paul wrote uh, 1 Corinthians and uh, wrote a letter of uh, correction and evidently the brethren began to work on those problems because by the time 2 Corinthians is written, some progress has been made and the uh, uh, immoral brother has been restored. Um, here is the point that um, uh, I wanted to, to get out for us to discuss, and that is uh, the matter of fellowship. We are in fellowship with all with whom God is in fellowship. And we don't have a right to exclude from our fellowship those that God has not excluded. Sometimes I think brethren make some rather harsh judgments in matters that uh, uh, involve withdrawing of fellowship when indeed God hasn't. I don't know exactly you know, where that line comes. There may be some very clear-cut cases, for example, uh, in the city where I preached a number of years ago before I arrived on the scene, there was a congregation in town that, uh, where the preacher began uh, preaching the doctrine of premillennialism and evidently the uh, elders went along with that and the entire congregation as far as uh, I can tell was pretty much wrapped up with premillennialism and a sister congregation withdrew fellowship publicly, wrote letters of withdrawal of fellowship from that congregation uh, for that false doctrine. Subsequently the preacher uh, in course of time left and f started his own church. I don't know if any corrections had ever been made in that congregation. Uh, now that I've arrived on the scene, uh, I, we, you know, we don't have any fellowship with that congregation. No fellowship has ever been reestablished with them. Even though where I preach there was no formal withdrawal of fellowship as far as making any statement was concerned, the uh, congregation there, I believe, just simply accepted the withdrawal from the sister congregation, and, and that was that. So we have a number of problems in the area of fellowship. I think we need to just be careful that we, we don't exclude those that the Lord includes, and we don't include those whom the Lord excludes. And now it's fishbone time. <clears throat> so we'll open the... Uh, uh, questioning up to uh, members of the audience, and you may ask uh, your questions, and I will, uh, by my authority, uh, give them to one of these other guys. <laughs> so are we able to direct questions to, to one of these guys? Yes, if you'll just identify yourself and where you're from, and then uh, state your question, and to whom you would like uh, to direct your okay, question. I'd like to direct this to Brother Massey. Uh, regarding radio stations as far as denomination, or actually it's a denominational radio station locally here that is owned by a denomination school and they're sponsored by that and everything, I want to know if it's sinful for a Church of Christ to broadcast on their radio station and encourage their listeners to listen to that false doctrine and also on Sundays they use mechanical instruments and things of that nature so I'd like for you to kind of deal with that as far as radio stations and if it's sinful or not. As far as I know all the media is corrupted. I don't know if you'll agree with that or not. I won't watch half of what's on television now. Maybe more than that. I hadn't really figured it out percentage-wise. But some of the things they show on television now is so ungodly and corrupt, it is of the devil. Denominationalism is of the devil. Uh, though I'm, I'm glad the Truth and Love program is on television. I'm extremely glad, and uh, great results, of course, are coming from that. Uh, and I, I don't know that I would view, I've not really thought of that question uh, before, but I don't know that I would uh, view a quote-unquote religious radio station any differently than I would some uh, atheistically owned television station. I've not really considered that, but I wouldn't see offhand, wouldn't see much difference in that. Uh, if we were on some country western radio station on Sunday morning, well, of course, uh, 
uh, they're going to be playing music on that as well. And, and just all Christians need to be aware of denominationalism, that we uh, do not condone it, and though our program may appear upon, uh, be broadcast upon one of their stations, or we do not condone uh, things that go on on NYPD Blue or whatever other program, ungodly program that it might be, we don't condone that either, though our, our television program may someday follow that program or it may be programmed in at the same time, we don't condone that. We condone the truth of the Bible. So I, I don't know that I could say that it would be, uh, I don't, uh, at this point could not say it would be sinful and wrong to do such. Another panel member want to respond to that? Anyone in the audience? Another question back here. <laughs> the wonders of modern science. There you go. Oh, okay. My name is Dwayne Patton. I'm a member at Seagaville Church, and I'm also a student here at Brown Trail. And I'd like to direct my question to Brother Summers. Uh, what is an individual member's responsibility concerning uh, how to handle uh, the situation in a congregation where the eldership is leaning toward uh, an erroneous doctrine or, or practices, uh, and, and particularly uh, a male member of the church there who is not an elder or a deacon? Uh, what would be their individual accountability and responsibility and action in such cases? Well, once again, these are always uh, difficult to answer because of so many uh, various circumstances that could exist. But just on the basis of what you said, anybody's, any man's responsibility would be to uh, talk with the elders if he were convinced that they were leaning uh, toward a doctrine that was that the, was just totally opposed to what the scriptures teach, and it was clear cut as distinguished from a matter of judgment or opinion. Uh, I think he would have the responsibility to go and talk to the elders about it. Now, what happens after that? Uh, good question. Uh, <clears throat> he might see if there's anybody else who agrees with him without uh, getting the reputation of uh, going to all the members and trying to cause trouble, but just kind of get a feel for how uh, do other people think? Is he the only one who thinks this doctrine is wrong? Uh, is it uh, about 50-50? What would the situation be? And uh, if the uh, elders are insistent upon this doctrine, there would come a point sometime when he would have to withdraw from that particular congregation and go to one that was teaching faithful doctrines in all things. Somebody else may want to Anyone else like to respond to that? I might make a suggestion. I was in a situation similar to that one occasion and uh, went to the elders with the problem and uh, made the suggestion that uh, we bring in another uh, brother to uh, study this question with them. Get somebody like Brother Summers to come down and, and uh, discuss this with the brethren and help them to... Uh, to uh, see the, the truth of, of this matter. And um, sometimes that, that works, sometimes they refuse that. Uh, if they're unwilling to, to study it, then uh, it indicates that uh, maybe they're, you know, they're determined to hold on to a, to a false doctrine when they're not, they're not open to uh, discussion. Anyone else, any other questions? Uh, oh, here's one back here in the back. Uh, my name is Grant Bucket here at Round Trail. And I have a question uh, relating to how to deal with uh, family members who have left the church. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5.11 says uh, not even to have, not even to eat with such a one who is uh, a Christian who is sinning. And uh, should we as Christians, if we have a relative in the family who has left the church, should we uh, disfellowship them and, and stop having um, um, discourse with them? I appreciate Perry Hall volunteering for that. <laughs> mm. Well, such a problem came up a few years ago and I sat down with Brother Roy Deaver, Brother Tom Warren and talked about that, what we should do in a situation like that and I must say that I owe a great debt to those two men. They've had a tremendous influence upon my life. 
And I uh, remember Brother Roy saying in that situation where a family member was not faithful and the congregation was faced with withdrawing that, that there are other responsibilities, other biblical principles that come into play, other obligations that we have to that individual that we must also implement. We certainly would let that family member know that we did not uh, go along with them on their unfaithfulness, whatever they might be doing or not doing. But as far as other responsibilities toward that family member, that we would become remiss if we fail to fulfill them. Uh, so we might be living in the same house with someone that had been withdrawn from, uh, but at the same time, as long as we did not give them Godspeed of the era in which they were in, I, if I had been withdrawn from I'd sure want my wife to cook those good meals she cooks. <laughs> and maybe because of her example and her love in 1 Peter 3, I might come to my senses. Uh, so I think that in that situation she would still have a responsibility. I have written a long paper on that, and if you'll give me your name and address, I'll send you a copy of it. <laughs> and maybe somebody wants to disagree. We'll have a sign-up sheet in the foyer for this paper. <laughs> Richard, do you want to respond to that? Certainly, it would make it difficult for a husband or wife situation for withdrawal complete and uh, not to eat with and uh, so forth. But uh, nonetheless, uh, w uh, we are not only brothers and sisters or in the flesh, but we are brothers and sisters in Christ too. And I do have a Christian duty. I do have an obligation to the scriptures, and I want to see that person reclaimed as much as any other member of the church, though it may be some relative of mine. And personally, I have uh, practiced uh, withdrawal of fellowship from family members, and I've seen that it has been useful and productive, though that doesn't necessarily prove it right or wrong. And uh, I've heard of others who have, have uh, chosen to do that as well. And I think as, as uh, brothers and sisters of Christ, we, have, if we want to see them back in Christ. Let's do what Christ said to do. Let's withdraw our fellowship from a family member, which it would have to be kind of a, an altered withdrawal with a husband and wife uh, a relationship, certainly so. It would, could not be a, a total as we could with others. All right. Now, according to my program, this um, it, we go another. I have been authorized to go another 15 minutes, uh, at least 10. All right. We have another question over here. It's on the blank there, okay? Ah, there we go. Uh, to respond back on the first question that was addressed to Richard, we might make a a distinction here. The question was whether it's what I understood. Was it wrong to use that radio company uh, to you further your, your message since they are not uh, sharing the same faith? And since our basic thrust is dealing with Calvinism, I see this as basically the same as, is pain and suffering evil? We understand that it's not. Dr. Warren has, has talked much about this. Brother Deaver also in class, especially in the, in the classes dealing with logic. So I, I, see, I see this in the same category. We're, we're, we're mixing these things up. The, the fact of the station itself would not be wrong. What is broadcast is not, uh, would have no effect upon me or anyone else. And what they do with their money or their, their uh, business transactions uh, would have no bearing upon uh, individuals listening to or using a station to further a message. So I think we're beginning to, sometimes we have a tendency to mix things and equate them as being one and the same, which is not necessarily the case. I'd like to make a comment on that, if I may. Uh, as I understand the principle involved, actually, we would be buying a service from them and using that airtime to preach the truth. I really think that uh, a lot of these uh, religious stations need 
some brethren preaching the truth firmly and faithfully and exposing error, the error that's preached on that radio program, and that we could become a bright and shining light in that situation. And we can do that without giving them Godspeed, because it's just like the brother said, what they in turn do with that money, we've got no control over. I, I buy groceries from a grocery store from a fellow that's not a member of the church. He is a devoted denominationalist. But I have bought a service from him, and how he uses that is his responsibility, not mine. And so I, I really don't see that if we remain faithful to the word, uh, that we would have an audience there that uh, really need to hear what we had to say. Another question. Uh, Jeffrey, did you want to respond to, because that was your question. Well, I wouldn't conclude that uh, myself. Uh, when my family and I lived in La Crosse, Wisconsin, uh, we had a daily radio program, I did, preached on it every day. It was owned by a very devout Roman Catholic, and three times a day we heard, Hail Mary, full of grace, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. That was at six o'clock in the morning, 12 at noon, and six o'clock in the evening. And all through the day, uh, you would hear things on occasion like that. But when I came on the air, the truth of God was upheld. And uh, I did not consider that as having fellowship with Roman Catholicism in any way, because there was a great distinction between what I said and their Hail Marys. got to slap it, Maxie. Yeah, there you go. Maxie. Now it, now it is. <laughs> Let me clarify what Jeff was talking about because he came by the office the other day to talk to me about it. He wasn't talking about us buying time on a radio station and broadcasting the truth, if I understand what he said. He was talking about a denominational station here in town and the other day when all the ice and snow came and everything, some of our brethren evidently called the station and told them that they weren't going to have services at a certain time, and that was on the air. I, isn't that what you were talking about? I don't think they were buying that time, Jeffrey. I think they were just simply using that as a means of letting people know. But anyway. All right, another. Uh... Oh, here we are, Dave. Go ahead. I would like to ask uh, any of you five men or any, any of our preachers who are here, if you were invited to come and speak on the Abilene Christian University lectureship, Tulsa Soul Winning Workshop, Jubilee in Nashville, and you were told that uh, there would be no restrictions placed upon you, would you be violating biblical teaching regarding fellowshipping of error, Ephesians 5, 11, 2 John 9, etc., if you were to attend? Then also would you answer the question, what if on a lectureship like this one, we were to invite a speaker 
who for, as far as we know, that speaker is a solid Bible preacher. We, we know of no error that he holds to or teaches. But he himself, at some point in the past, had spoken at one of those locations. Would we be sinning in having that individual speak on this lectureship? And would the other speakers be sinning if they spoke on this lectureship, knowing that he had been permitted to speak on this lectureship? <laughs> Thank you for that um, succinct question. Now, do we have these hands are raising uh, so fast, I just I can't see them. Richard, do you want to jump on in the middle of that? I, I think it's uh, pretty typical uh, of us as human beings to look on the critical side of things, don't we? We always say, whoa, it really rained hard, we really had a bad flood. We, we really look at the negative things in life without actuating the positive a lot of times. If I were to see a lecture program, and let's say there's one person on there that may be of question, what have I done with all those other faithful names on there? What have I done with all of those faithful men who've stood so long and so strong for the truth? Why don't I say, well, that's a fine lectureship there. Look who they have on there. They have some fine speakers. But typical of us, we often want to have the critical eye and we'll say, uh-oh, there's a name that I perceive liberalism in because of some past uh, place of, uh, that they have spoken and therefore become critical of the whole program. It, isn't that strange? I mean, that's been kind of my experience. They, they overlook all of those other names and they f finger out the one and they say, well, that's, those folks are liberal over there because they have one person on there that I perceive to maybe be off base or something. And I, I think that we need to start looking on some of the other sides as much as we can. I know we've got a lot of things wrong in our, in our uh, world today and in the church today. And all of us, there's not a person here among those I, of the faith that we wouldn't stand against false doctrine and wouldn't stand against it. Now I have personally, and I know probably everyone here, uh, Gary just said that uh, today that he spoke at a seven day Adventist assembly. And I've spoken at, uh, I don't even know what they were, they were meeting in a cafe. <laughs> <laughs> they just asked me to come over there one day and I said I'll come over there and speak, but then I'm going back to the assembly of the Church of Christ to partake of the Lord's Supper, do you understand that? And they said yes, we understand that, come over and speak to us. And I came over and spoke the truth uh, of the gospel and pointed out the things that they needed to do in order to be saved. And, and as long as we're, we're doing that, uh, that's, you know, Paul went into the synagogue, he preached the truth there. And certainly that's what we want to do as well. I don't know if I've answered that question or not. I appreciate what you've had to say. Let me just respond in this way. I think there, there are two questions there. Number one, suppose we get an invitation from one of these groups like Jubilee or or uh, Tulsa. Uh, I too was invited to speak um, to a Seventh-day Adventist uh, group and uh, I accepted the invitation and did not uh, think in any way that I was in fellowship with them. They certainly didn't think so when I got through. <laughs> if uh, I were to be invited to, to speak uh, at one of these uh, occasions where some of our liberal brethren are speaking, uh, I would accept the invitation uh, if, I, if, if they uh, place no restrictions upon me and uh, go and preach the truth. I would go and preach on the Pope's balcony if uh, he invited me to do so. Uh, however, I don't think I would have a return engagement. Uh, secondly, uh, to go, uh, to pick up a, um, let's say I pick up a, an advertisement for the Fort Worth lectures and I, I scan down through here and I find, uh, oh, here's a brother on here that uh, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't hold the same position on something that, that I do. Let's suppose I happen to know that here's a brother that believes in the uh, uh, head covering for women in uh, the worship assembly. Am I to conclude that all on that program hold that position? Do I assume 
that to be the case? Do, is the whole program tainted because that brother holds something different from what I believe? Or if I should look down and I find on this program a brother who has uh, spoken at one of these questionable lectureships? Um, as Richard said, you know, does that, is that going to uh, automatically uh, taint the whole uh, lectureship here? Uh, I don't think it should. I think uh, we ought to be able to uh, uh, discern between those who are habitually teaching false doctrine and someone who has uh, uh, on, on occasion uh, gone and spoken the truth at uh, these lectureships. Um, we don't certainly don't endorse uh, Jubilee or uh, the Tulsa Workshop. Uh, but if a brother has been invited to go and speak, and if he goes and speaks the truth, I uh, can't find fault with that brother. Now, Gary has a response. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that anybody uh, would suggest uh, withdrawing fellowship in a qu uh, question such as was posed, but there is something that we need to remind ourselves uh, of, and that is that uh, God is not against us. And Jesus is not bloodthirsty just looking to see which member of his church he can cast out. That's not his philosophy as uh, obviously was brought up uh, earlier with the uh, situation in Corinth. Paul patiently uh, worked through the problems and uh, besought them to uh, correct them. Also brought up with the congregations in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Uh, corrections were to be made but the initial was, response was not well we're not going to have anything to do with you. Uh, so we need to realize that God is for the church and that we likewise should be for one another and uh, for uh, loving brethren and doing those things which are productive of good, not saying that we should never go to somebody to talk about what we think is a problem. We should. But uh, let's not be in the uh, accusatory mood. Very good. Our authorized time has expired and uh, therefore we're going to have to uh, draw this to a close and uh, I'll just summarize uh, very briefly uh, in about two minutes of unauthorized time. But I already know what ML wants to say. <laughs> Speak on, Brother Sexton. Well, We're glad, glad that you persisted there. Well, that's, that's all. Didn't mean to overlook you. I know that, but I, you don't have to, you know, I don't have to speak. But anyway, I was just going to mention uh, here, and I, what uh, Brother Perry said a few moments ago about this fellowship he's on about Roy Deaver and them. I appreciate that. That, that was, I thought, right down the line. Uh, I might tell a little thing, though, that happened in Alabama. This is Lamar County. Uh, I was right, afraid of that. Yeah, years ago. <laughs> but this is, this is kind of funny in a way. I wouldn't say this is a thing to practice, but there was a fellow in the congregation there where I preached. It happened before I moved there, but I was familiar with it, that uh, they had the discipline, and they did, and they withdrew from it. So to make a long story short, he went home to dinner that day, and his wife put his stuff to eat out on the back porch table and she said he said what's this he, she said well we, they withdrew from you and my bible tells me that we're not supposed to eat with you he said that's where you'll eat from now on i'll always fix your meals now he came back and made his confession that night <laughs> but but anyway uh, on this thing about uh, preaching i preached a few years ago at methodist church here in fort worth two or three gospel preachers criticized me for it of course i didn't i knew i was right but i can preach anywhere I would make a difference to me where it is, on the radio, television, or I can go to that uh, denominational church. I preached on worship that day. I started out and I said, now listen, I said, I'm not a member of the Methodist church. Of course, you knew that when you invited me. I don't believe Methodist doctrine. You knew that when you invited me. And you don't believe evidently what I preach or you wouldn't be where you are. But I said, We're going, I'm going to talk to you and tell you what I believe about worship. We'll still be friends, as far as I'm concerned, after it's all over. And I did. And I'd do it again. And I might mention this over in Mississippi, uh, close to the Alabama line, years ago. This is before my time. But I knew about it. There's this well-known thing over there, and I don't know all the details. But Brother C.R. Nickel came to that part of the country and held a gospel meeting in a seven-day Advent church building. 
the Lord's church is meeting there today and worshiping there. And some of you have ever been in that part of the country may have heard about that. So this old business that you can't preach somewhere because some sectarians preach there, he's been there because it's liberalism. The Lord said it's not those who are well who need the position, it's those who are sick. The apostles went into the synagogues, and that was certainly something corrupt. They preached the gospel. They were thrown out sometime, but they went and preached the gospel. And we ought not to ever lose sight of the fact that we're out here in the soul-saving business, preach the gospel whenever we have the opportunity. Thank you, Brother Sexton. I appreciate that. I, I would just say this, that if the, some of these brethren who take their time to attack a, an excellent program such as the Fort Worth Lectures would turn their attention to the true false teachers and liberals in the church, uh, they would uh, do well. Uh, fellowship is a precious thing. We ought not to take it lightly. We have no right to exclude from our fellowship those whom God includes. And we have no right to include in our fellowship those whom God excludes. Those who have obeyed the gospel and are walking in the light we are in fellowship with. Those who transgress and go beyond the doctrine of Christ uh, we are not in fellowship with. And uh, sometimes brethren are so quick to make a judgment when uh, the judgment is really not theirs to make. Thank you so much. We appreciate uh, the uh, good work of the panelists. And Maxie, we'll turn it back to you. I am grateful to these brethren. I think they've done a